Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Today we've got kind of an interesting one. If you think this is just an R6 with a special finish, like me, <laughs> you're wrong. There's actually quite a bit of a backstory to this one. So strap in for an exciting episode. Okay, so this is a 2007 limited run Les Paul R6 1956 reissue in a tobacco sunburst finish, also sometimes called dark burst. This was part of Gibson's popular demand series that they did in 2007, which pretty much documented guitars that had an interesting story behind them. Kind of what they did later on with the collector's choice runs, kind of. So some of the ones in this lineup were this one, the Dark Burst R6. There was a red top R8, a black plastics R7. I think those things are really cool looking and an ebony top R6. Now, nobody's really sure how many of each of these they made because you'll find it floating around a lot that there's 150 of these guys out there. But some people think that might be misinformation that spread from 150 in total from the whole series. For example, the Ebony Top R6, there's apparently only like 10 of those out there. So the other number that shows up a lot for this particular one is 60. Either way, it's pretty rare. But as I was hinting to earlier, each of the guitars within these series had a story behind them. So the first Les Paul Sunburst, or at least one of the first ones, looked very similar to this. There was a gentleman that lived in West Virginia who wanted a Les Paul to match his L5, his fancy big jazz box guitar that had a tobacco sunburst looking finish. So he went to his local store and said, hey, can I get a Les Paul to look like this? The store owner said, well, there's been rumors Gibson was gonna start doing burst finishes instead of just gold like you would normally find on all the Les Pauls. So they submitted a custom order and Gibson accepted it and then issued him one that looked very similar to this in 1956. So that's kind of the story behind these and why they were kind of reissued in this small limited edition run that almost nobody knows about. So other than that, you know, a 56 reissue, it's reissuing this version of the gold top. We can go through the history where Les Pauls first started with P90 pickups. You can either have the first and second year of production with the trapeze tailpiece, then they switched to the wraparound bridge. And then finally the ABR1 was birthed in 1956. After that, you get humbuckers and the burst is born. But this is that last stage before they eventually reached perfection before anybody knew it. So not much more of a story to tell you on this one besides that. So let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench and take a look at its individual parts. I don't know about you guys, but I think this thing would look sweet with black plastics. The poker chip dark, the pickups dark. Obviously you need one cut for P90s and like the black reflectors nice and aged. I think that would really transform the look of this one from beautiful to evil. But I first thought of that because I took the pickup covers off here and these cannot be original. I don't think so anyways. They have this ridge right here that Gibson ones normally don't have. And after comparing this to others, I have to say at least the pickup covers have been replaced. Now the thing that kind of stinks about Gibson P90s is they never mark them. I mean, it's got the Gibson braided shielding wire. However, I can't really be confident if these are the original pickups or not. So I'm gonna go ahead and sell these as non-original pickups just in case. Something to know about P90 Historics versus like the Gibson USA counterparts is the routes are actually the correct depth for the pickup. Whereas the USA ones, they'll use springs and whatnot. You can see just how shallow this route is. Now you can add little foam strips like these if you need the pickups to be raised a little bit more. But the only other thing to know about these guys is long neck tenon and they're always happy to see you because that's where the P90 gets mounted. Middle position reads 4.05. Bridge 8.1, and the neck almost even, 8.09. The bridge on these guys is a proper Gibson ABR1 with wire, so these saddles aren't just gonna fall out on you, and it does read Gibson ABR1. And in true historic fashion, they're drilled directly into the top. And the tailpiece is lightweight aluminum. As far as the rest of the guitar goes, you get your ambered switch tip, makes it look super vintage-y. I love the plain top nature of this one. Wildwood also did a run of these around 2000, 2001, but apparently those ones got flame tops. You can see you've got your golden knobs with the thumb bleeders, and it kind of looks good without a pick card too. So two-piece maple top, mahogany back, not chambered or anything like that, 
and a mahogany neck with a rosewood fretboard. Now, if you remember in the unboxing video of this one, this one has a loose inlay. This one will come off if you pry it off. But while I was playing, I can't actually just get it to fall off by shaking the guitar. You kind of got to get your nail by it. But when you're bending the note, sometimes it will move. I was gonna re-glue it, but then it's like, well, I don't have the proper inlay glue. I'm not really skilled with doing that, so maybe this will go to somebody who would rather have it done a certain way. So I just decided to leave it alone. But other than that, you just kind of have some minor fret wear. Nothing that you're really gonna have to worry about. You have your historic style truss rod cover. You can see they kind of have a larger bevel to them. They're very fancy looking. And here's your truss rod. Everything looks good there. The threads are about even with the top, so you've got life left and the higher up Les Paul model silkscreen and the Gibson Mother of Pearl logo. Nut width of 1.69 inches, 12th fret of 2.05. First fret nice and chunky, 0.95, and all the way up to 1.04 by the 12th. I mean, this is definitely a fat, chunky guy neck. No surprise here, 24 and 3 quarters inch scale length. Moving on to the back here, I love this color. It's not quite a dark back, but it's a nice molasses back, I guess we could say. And looking inside here, yeah, this confirms everything I need to see. Those are not the original pickups. Now, it's still a high-quality pickup, maybe made by Gibson, or maybe it's just the originals back in there, and they put whatever covers they had on their swapped-out ones back on those. We'll never know, I'm but I'm going to go ahead and say they've been replaced because those solder joints are not original. But you can still see the R6 stamp right there and the bumblebee caps. Just as fair warning, those might not be original to this either because inside the case is Lux cap sticker. So very possible those are replacements for the original Bumbles. I'm not really familiar with the markings between those two, but those solder joints have been touched up as well. So very possible those have been upgraded. What the inside of the toggle switch cavity looks like and everything's good here. Not a lot of wear on the back of this one. You've got your original style strap buttons on here yet too and a beautiful one piece mahogany neck here. Super chunky as we were talking about. And back here we have double line, single ring Cluson tuners. So the way to date most of the historics is this will be your year. So this could technically be a 1997 or a 2007. How do you know which one it is? Well, I happened to get lucky by finding that this was a limited edition run, but say yours was a gold top, uh, you gotta look at other specs, like what case does it have? What kind of certificate of authenticity does it have? So this one, since it has a Gibson Custom Shop style case, that ruled it out from being a 1997, unless it was replaced. It can kind of get hairy. Your best bet is just to email Gibson Photos and they can tell you. I can't believe this thing only weighs 9 pounds, 9.7 ounces. It feels so heavy. All that weight must be in the body. Now that we know all about this instrument, let's go ahead and hear how it sounds.
So what are my final thoughts on this instrument? I was actually surprised. I didn't realize when I bought this how rare it was. I just thought, eh, it's a different color on an R6. Might as well document it, right? I didn't know it was part of something called the Popular Demand series, nor had I had ever heard of that before. So kind of cool in a collector's perspective, but is it necessarily any better than any other R6 out there? Nah, not really. So it mainly comes down to if you like the finish or if you'd rather have a gold top. So now that we know everything about this guitar, let's go ahead and review its condition in case you're interested in purchasing it. You can check out the link in the description for that. Overall, this instrument, it's in pretty good shape. You've got some scratches from string change and some light lacquer checking on the face of the headstock. Nothing too crazy, but it is there. I want you to know it's there. Truss rod's in good shape. It's working just fine. The frets and fretboard were just cleaned and conditioned, so you're good to go there. The only thing to really know about these, besides very, very light fret wear, is this 15th fret inlay being a little bit loose. But as you can see, you can shake this guitar around and bang it up a little bit. It never like falls out. You have to pick it out, but it does move when you're bending on that note. As I said in the bench demo, I would fix it, but I'm sure somebody would be very unhappy with the glue that I would choose to use. Face of the instrument, you've got some picking scratches, just light wear and tear. I'm sure a professional polish and buffing job would make this look like brand new. However, you do have a few light nicks and dings. And again, the pickups have likely been replaced, or at least the pickup covers. And there's a little bit of finish checking lines that occur around the binding. That is very common to see, but it is a little bit of a visual eyesore. Once I point it out anyways, it takes a while for you to notice it. And there is a color difference between the pickups and the pick guard and the poker chip. That's the first thing that set me off knowing something had been replaced. Back of the instrument, you have some light edge wear, so a few light nicks and dings, but nothing too crazy going on. No breaks, cracks, or repairs or anything like that. There are some light impressions on the neck, just from playing the guitar. Maybe a capo or two has been on it, but, but no like huge divoting. And the back is surprisingly also in good shape. You've got some light impressions, some nicks and dings, buckle worming, very minimally, but I would say this thing was well taken care of. Taking a look around the edges, it looks like there might actually be a small touch up spot right here. Right there, we'll have to take a look under black light. That feels like somebody used a touch up pen or something like that because it got a ding. Doesn't look too bad and it's on the side of the guitar that you never see, but I definitely want you to be aware that it is there. So I would say this is in very good condition, but I always advertise everything as good. Now we'll do a black light test. It looks like you've got a little bit of sweat absorption right here. Nothing that you can see in regular lighting situations, but hey, now at least we know somebody played this thing. <laughs> so everything's good there. We'll run it up the neck here. Can't really tell much. But face of the headstock's looking good. Back of the neck is also looking good. Nice even glow. Sometimes the backs of the necks will glow a little bit more if there's a particularly sweaty guy playing this thing a lot but no breaks, cracks, or repairs that I am seeing. Looks like you've got a little bit more sweat absorption in this area. So interesting, sweaty guy, but he doesn't have sweaty hands. <laughs> it's amazing what this black light can tell, right? Looks like you got a little bit of finish wear here from your strap. Yep, there we go, small touch up. I knew we would see that. So overall, passes the black light test. This instrument comes in a Gibson custom shop case. You've got some light wear and tear here, some scratches and whatnot, a little bit of dust as well. Uh, I did clean out the inside of this one, so don't let the outside scare you. But the latches, they're present, functioning, handle's still there. These usually don't break off of these guys. And the interior is this nice dark burgundy material. I think these are some of my favorite custom shop cases. They're just so protective. You got good heel support, double neck rest, and inside your little compartment here will sleep all your case candy. So you've got your Lux B sticker, you've got original silica packet, marketing material, customer care guide, original truss rod, you even have the case key. And the most important is the certificate of authenticity. Usually these things get lost because, hey, they're giant pieces of paper. They don't really fit in the case unless you let it rub against the guitar. 
Because some people will file these away, they'll lose them, or they just threw them away because that was before people really understood that a COA meant money. <laughs> but you're all good to go on this one. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this Dark Burst Les Paul R6, feel free to check out that link in the description that will take you to the Reverb for Sale page. Thank you Troglodytes for watching, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.